The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. There has never been so much uneasiness and restlessness not just among the believers but also in the secular world where people are uncertain about the future when you watch the news if it's not chaos in one side at one part of the world some part of the world there's disease and famine elsewhere there's injustice violence in one some part of the world and there's moral bankruptcy in some others there's financial crisis that is going on somewhere and the political tensions that are raging on where there's wars and rumors of wars that are going on. And you might say these things have happened all along throughout history. You're right. But there's something called gathering momentum. Things have picked up speed in this world. The rate at which things are happening is exorbitant. It's crazy. It's beyond normal. So what is happening among the people is people are now tentative that something big is about to happen. Do you feel that when you are? I feel that there's something it's going somewhere here. Something big is about to happen. Would that be a natural disaster? Would that be an economic meltdown? Would that be a global pandemic? Or would that be a terrorist attack, an EMP outburst somewhere, it uh, knocks off all kinds of technology. I think people think they have survival skills, I think, but people won't survive if their Wi-Fi is off for 10 minutes. And we're living in times where situations have changed. We're living in times where godly morals and values like love, kindness, mercy, forgiveness, compassion, giving and sharing are replaced with pride, selfishness, hatred, murder, jealousy, lust, greed, and envy. Morality has been redefined. Strangely enough, Bible already foresaw the prophets of the word of God already looked at these times and said, there will be times where people call good evil and evil good. That's exactly what is happening, ladies and gentlemen. Something is seriously wrong with the world system. And we all know something is lurking at the corner where God is about to do something. I always get amazed by why God is strangely silent when 53 million babies are killed every year. I am amazed by the fact when moral depravity is increasing and we are blatantly shaking our fist in the face of God, why is God remaining silent? Strangely enough, we are living in times where we can't tell who is a criminal and who is a saint. There seems to be a greater concern for the animals that are killed in Africa than the people who are starving. So what kind of times are we living in? Ravi Zacharias, a man of God, said this. These days are not just that the line between the right and wrong has been made unclear. Today, Christians are being asked by the culture to erase the lines, move the fences, and if that were not bad enough, we are asked to join in celebration cry by those, a celebration cry by those who have thrown off the restraints of religion uh, that has imposed upon them. It's not just that they, uh, we, uh, that they ask, we accept. The world is asking, now demanding us to celebrate immorality. If you look at how we, I hate to use the word evolved, how we came to this place in 1950s, Ravi Zacharias talks about how kids came to this place. In 1950s, kids lost their innocence. They were liberated from parents by well-paying jobs, cars, lyrics, and music that gave rise to a new term called generation gap. In 1960s, the kids lost authority. It was a decade of protests. Church, state, parents were, uh, were all called into cushion and found wanting. The authority was rejected, yet nothing ever replaced it. In 1970s, the kids lost the meaning of love. It was a time, the decade, where me-ism dominated. 
It's, it's prefaced by the word self, self-image, self-esteem, self-assertion. It is made, you know, it made for a lonely world. The kid learned everything to know about sex and forgot everything about love. And nobody had the nerve to tell them that there was a difference. In 1980s, kids lost their hope, stripped of their innocence, authority, and love, plagued by the horror of nuclear nightmare. A large and growing numbers of the generation stopped believing in the future. That's the uh, 80s. In 90s, the kids lost the power to reason. Less and less were they taught the basics of the language, truth, logic, and they grew up with the irration irrationality of the post-modern world. Somebody said we have smarter phones and dumber kids. That's true, because they were never taught any better. A millennium kid wakes up to find himself nowhere. He doesn't know what changes. He's, he can't keep up with this change. He lost imagination. He doesn't know how to dig holes in the backyard. He only knows just how to play video games. He's entertained by violence, perversion. And we, we cannot talk about innocent kids anymore because we don't know who really is innocent. We are living in some confused times. Many people are not optimistic about their future. And somebody said we are misty optic about our future. We really don't know what's up, what's ahead. We are entering into testing times. God's judgment is about to be poured out upon this land. The horizon is dark, the clouds are looming. So my question to us this morning, are these truly the last days? Or is this just another cycle of paranoia and fear where, yeah, okay, yeah, all these things, yeah, they happened before kind of stuff, or is it for real that we are in the final years, weeks, hours of the Lord's return? Are we close to Jesus coming back? Are we closer than ever? Is there evidence in the scripture that this is indeed the conclusion of history and we are the last generation? The answer to this question comes through Bible prophecy. And the one thing I like about God is he declares the end from the beginning. Bible says this, remember the former things long past, for I am the God and there is no other. I am the God, there is none, no one like me declaring the end from the beginning. And from the ancient, time, ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God declares the end from the beginning. He knows what's about to happen. He declared the whole story. And one of the most critical things for us to understand times that we're living in is prophecy. And one of the most amazing prophecy that was recorded in the Bible is in Daniel chapter 2 where a king named Nebuchadnezzar, a real king of Babylon who existed, he had a dream once. And that dream was so phenomenal that becomes a landmark to understand the times that we are living in. And in this dream, he saw a statue, a statue with a head of gold, a chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron and feet, which is partly iron and partly clay. And he was so bothered by this dream Nebuchadnezzar was, and he said, can anybody explain what this dream means? Nobody could explain other than one man. His name was Daniel. And he said, dreams and interpretations of dreams belong to God. So he, ex he explains this. And this, ladies and gentlemen, this dream is the history of the whole world. It starts with the head of Babylon. The Babylon is the Nebuchadnezzar's empire, the Babylonian empire. That's how it started off. Nebuchadnezzar is one of the famous kings. And also there's another guy called Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. These are some of the names you see in the book of Daniel. It's a very prominent, powerful kingdom. But after the head of gold, after the Babylonian empire, King Cyrus of the Medo-Persians, he came and took over the Babylonian kingdom without a battle. It captured the city without a battle. It's a full story, amazing story. And the king called Cyrus, he took over. So for two centuries, the Medo-Persians, the chest of silver, began to dominate history. That was the empire. Following that came the bronze, uh, the belly and thighs of bronze in the statue, which is the Greek Empire. It was ruled by an ambitious 
a ruler named Alexander the Great. And by the way, there's more evidence that Jesus Christ walked out of the grave than Alexander the Great ever lived, by the way. Okay? Just so that, you know, a side tidbit. Okay? So Alexander the Great, by the age of 27, he was so ferocious, he had massive empire that he took over. At the age of 29, he fell on his bed weeping, it seems, saying that he has no more kingdoms to conquer. He died at the young age of 33. After he died, his empire was split into four parts and there were four generals who took over. And then we enter a period called the silent period. You see in your Bibles, there's Old Testament and New Testament and separated by one page. That page is 400 years. Okay? That is called the silent period where, you know, but I don't believe God ever remains silent, by the way. This was the time where Greek was becoming the universal language. The scenario is being set for the Messiah to come, Jesus Christ to come. And around 163 BC, before Christ, 163 years before Christ, the iron part of the statue began to take shape. That's the beginning of the Roman Empire. The Rome, Rome emerged, 168 BC, sorry. That's the time where the Roman kingdom Begin, began to emerge. They began to dominate after the Grecian rule, after Alexander's rule. They became powerful. It was during this time that Jesus Christ came to the Middle East. It was a time where all these things have happened. They lasted till 400 years after the death of Christ, 476 AD. The Roman Empire first split into two, the eastern segment and the western segment. No wonder you have two legs. With me so far? Okay. And then the Roman Empire disappeared. That's what we'll call it the phase one. But it never actually disappeared. Now we are entering into the times where the final phase of the iron and clay, the feet, iron and clay coming together. It's 1600 years since the Roman Empire disintegrated, but it's all coming back together now. And scholars believe, and I agree, we are living in times where the Roman Empire will be revived and the Antichrist is going to come forth. But remember, Rome is not just the Vatican City. You also need to remember that the eastern segment of the Roman Empire lasted a thousand years more than the western segment. So the Middle Eastern area could be the place where Antichrist could come from. So we are living in times where this empire could be revived. And ladies and gentlemen, the good news is we are here. You seeing that? The iron and we are here. We are the final phase. What is the next thing that's about to happen? Here is a good thing. The rock and the stone comes in this dream and it shatters the whole statue and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. That stone represents the kingdom of the Messiah. The kingdom of Messiah is about to come and it establish itself and we are at the threshold of the end of history. Isn't that wonderful? So are you glad you're living now? Okay, good. But having shown you all this, you might say, well, it's a significant prophet, prophetic dream. There's a lot of evidence and the whole history of mankind is right there. It's great to see that, but do you have more? Do you have more? Are, are these truly the last days? Ask me that. Do you have more? Otherwise, I'll be done my sermon now, okay? I have more, okay? There is more evidence biblically that we are living in the last days. One of the biggest and the greatest themes in the Bible is the theme of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The single greatest theme in the Bible is the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are more than 300 prophecies about the first coming of Jesus Christ. 300 prophecies about the first coming of Jesus Christ, but there are eight times more prophecies, both in the old and the new, about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? The 2,400 verses describing Christ's return. Why is there so much scripture that describes the return of Christ? Well, very simple reason. We need to be prepared. 
God took extra measures so that we do not, do not ignore the prophetic signs. We do not ignore the times for the nearness of his return. We cannot be foolish and compromise with our lifestyle because life is too short and his return is very near. His kingdom will be established. Eternity is at stake. So the possibility for us to witness his coming is very real. Is this going to happen during our lifetime? I personally think, this is my opinion, I personally think we will see it during our lifetime. The way things are happening, the evidence that is around me, in my studies, in my prayer, in how the Spirit of the Lord is assuring me, it's coming um, more and more, it's being assured in my heart that yes, Biblically, prophetically, in the assurance of the Holy Spirit, we are in the last days. Skeptics can say, well, uh, why should we believe that? It's a lot of generations claim that they were the last. You know, somebody wrote a book in 88 calling 88 reasons for Christ coming in 1988. It didn't happen. He wrote another book in 89 reasons for Christ coming in 89. And apparently they sold the 88 reasons for Christ coming in 88 in the Christian bookstore. And a person asked, why do you still have the 88 reasons if, since it's 89? The guy said it's half price. So we are caught up with all these dates setting. I'm not setting any dates here, but skeptics say, yeah, well, it happened again and again. But even that Bible predicts and says people will be saying peace and safety. Everything is fine. And that's when Christ will return. But there are numerous prophecies that have been fulfilled in the past century. The rate at which the prophecies are being fulfilled is enormous. It's, it's an exponential rate. Everything clearly leading to the culmination of events. There are numerous signs are there, but I'll only take you through five signs this morning and see how we are living in the very last days. Number one, the restoration of the nation of Israel. This is one of my favorite topics. I can talk about this forever. Ezekiel 36, 24, it says, For I take you out of the nations. God is telling the Israelites, I'll take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. In 70 AD, the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem. And they had some revolts and revolutions. The Jewish people revolted in the land of Israel for another couple of decades, a few decades, but didn't last they were scattered all over the world. Israel became wilderness around the first century. Miraculously, 2,000 years later, after Hitler's Holocaust, the Jewish people were brought back into the land. They were reestablished, and May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation. And as God promised in the prophecy, everybody before 90, 1948, nobody knew how that could happen. How can a nation come back together and be formed after being scattered for 2,000 years? It is darn near impossible, like the word darn. Is that a Canadian thing? Darning means knitting, right? Yeah, anyway, I don't know why you say what you say. You made me a culprit as well, all right? 2,000 years later, Israel came back and became a nation, and it's still in existence today. And when it became a nation, the very day it became a nation, there are numerous prophecies that were fulfilled. I'll just list a few. Uh, Bible says in Amos chapter 9, 14 and 15, Jacob's descendants will regain control. Uh, Ezekiel says Israel will be brought back to life. I just spoke Israel being reborn in one day. Can a nation be born in one day? That itself is phenomenal. It happened. As soon as Israel became a nation in 1948, all the biblical scholars, their antennas perked up. It's like, are we living in the last moments of our life? Because God said, as soon as this nation comes, it is time for us to watch because he's going to return. So Israel happened in 1948. God prophesied. And the Bible also says it's the first Israel will be, uh, the second Israel will be far more impressive than the first one. Then it also says in many other places, Israel would return to their own land and God himself would watch over them as he gathers them. And he also says the Israeli, Israeli army, sorry, Israeli army would be very powerful, disproportionately powerful in Leviticus 26, 3, 7, 7 and 8. Strangely enough, when Israel became a nation, 
Within a few hours, six nations, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, invaded Israel. Within hours of it becoming a nation. The combined strength of the rest of the nations was 20 million, and Israel was only 1 million Jews. They had no weaponry. All that was donated was from the world war, and that's what they gathered, but Israel won the war. Tell me if it's not a miracle. And the people themselves realized it. it the Israeli general said, God fought for us. And there's numerous stories how God helped them win this war against 20 million it's always God, the Israelis' battles are very strange. Gideon, 300 people versus the Midianites. He said the disproportionate equation. God always wanted to prove to these guys that I am your God. Let me show you how I move. In 1967, uh, Israel waged a six day war, and that's when they got back in Jerusalem. They heard, about a preempt, uh, they heard about Egyptians and all the forces getting ready to attack Israel. They had a preemptive strike, and they took out all the planes in Egypt and all their bases before they could take off. Phenomenal. In 1973, October 6th, uh, uh, October 6th Egypt and Syria joined again to attack Israel, and Israel able, was able to push them back. Praise the Lord. What an evidence. You know, somebody said, if you look at Israel... You're looking at God's timepiece. You're looking at God's clock. So I watch Israel very closely. Because anything that happens to them tells me what God is up to. Right? So we are living in times where literally things are coming together super fast. And the fortunes of the people will be restored. And Israel has produced so many Nobel, Nobel laureates. Uh, it's absolutely, um, absolutely amazing for a country that's smaller than the size of New Jersey. Phenomenal, phenomenal way God moves among this, this piece of real estate that he claims to be his. And in the last days this has happened. That is one of the biggest signs, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I want to start off with. Number two sign is a sign of the nature. Luke 21, 11 says, And there will be great earthquakes in various places, plagues and famines. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. This category of signs for Christians has been the least respected and least ignored because people say, well, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, things like this have happened in the past. There's nothing new about it. But there's something that God wants us to know through this. Christ says, these are the signs for the beginning of birth pangs. I am a father... And my wife, when she's about to give birth to a baby, I understand what, what birth pangs mean. You, you probably experienced that. She was happy and smiling. And next thing you know, she's saying, drive. <laughs> and it was 10-minute breaks in between, then kept getting closer and closer. And there, there was even a time, I think, Sarah, forgive me for saying that, I was asking her directions going to the hospital with the first baby. I said, should I take this turn or that turn? She said, shut up and drive. <laughs> then I realized the gravity of the situation. <laughs> then I also understood what birth pangs meant. Thank God for men. <laughs> Praise the <laughs> Lord. <laughs> yeah. You know, but the, the key thing I want you to notice is, as the delivery, as the baby is about to come out, the duration between those spasms or contra contractions becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And I want to show you, God said there will be earthquakes, plagues, famines, and diverse places. And here are some of the charts I want to show you. Earthquakes with a magnitude between 6 to 8. See the chart in the 19th century, how it was then to what it is now till 2011, did it increase in the number of earthquakes with that frequency between 6 to 8 magnitude? I'll show you another chart. Here's a cluster from the first century AD to 2014. See how earthquakes 7 plus, how they were so scattered, but look at the time we are in now. Look at all the uh, aggregate or uh, clustered blue dots here. There's an increase 
in birth pangs. I want to show you a little uh, video clip from NOAA, our uh, uh, government website. See how the earthquakes are happening. That's uh, the ring of fire, how the frequency has increased as well. And this is from uh, 2004, uh, 2004 to 2014. These are the kind of earthquakes, the magnitude that has increased in various places. God said that, that the birth pangs would increase. And, all, increase. and also it says, uh, the loss or the disasters that the Bible talks about, see the increase uh, in number of geophysical activities, the meteorological events, hydrological, climatology. You see the increase in numbers. You'll also see the disasters. There are 980 events that have happened in 2014 alone. Okay, so the things are increasing. Things are increasing drastically. He also said there'll be poverty, there's, there'll be famines. And if you look at the chart, the poverty line, people are, the need or the people surviving with less and less money is increasing again. The increase in hunger. One out of nine people go to bed hungry every night, it seems. Many people are below the poverty line, and that is increasing gradually more and more. The consumption this is staggering. The world's richest, richest, I'm not talking Warren Buffett, that's you. World's richest, tw consume 20%, 20% of the world's richest consume 76.6% of the food, uh, the produ produce in this world. Can you imagine? All right? The world's poorest only consume 1.5%. So we are the ones, we eat a lot, okay? And you look at the financial situation, look at the debt of the United States, look at Japan, you know, the debt is increasing. The financial situation is not looking good. So circumstances, situations, earthquakes, plagues, famines, terrors, there's a lot more uh, charts you can go through, but you know there is an increase in the frequency. The next thing is the signs in the society. What kind of times you're living in? Bible, strangely enough, a 2,000-year-old uh, compilation of books, but yet it's so relevant today. It says in 2 Timothy, and this is the most astonishing scripture, realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents. Isn't that strange? Ungrateful, irre irreconcilable, malicious, gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, Treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This sounds like a evening broadcast news for you. It's right there. Every symptom is already described. And the Bible says there'll be self, money, pleasure. This is what people are driven to. You see that around you? Or am I the only guy? This is predicted and prophesied by Paul to Timothy. And this is the times we're living in. There's a, something called humanism, where it's a love of self. Feed me, take care of me, clothe me stuff. There's hedonism, the lovers of pleasure. All they want is pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And there's people with materialism. The love of things, money, greed, all these things will dominate these last days. Violence will increase. Sexual immorality will increase. Christ said these will be the, like the days of Noah. It's a very weighted statement. What kind of days did Noah live in? We need to understand and not understand the circumstances. There's number four sign. It's a sign in politics. You're with me so far. You're seeing the signs here. You see the relevance of what God is trying to show us beforehand. Matthew 24, 20, uh, 24 6 and 7 says... You will be hearing wars and rumors of wars. The word rumor means news. It doesn't mean a fake war. It means the news of wars. For a nation will rise against a nation and a kingdom against a kingdom. One of the things I was trying to follow this week is between the North Koreans and the South Koreans. There's been a lot of aggression, a lot of tit for tat. They were having loudspeakers, propaganda, things happening. They're fine. They, they planted some landmines. The tension, because there's a great deal of tension because nobody knows how North Korea is going to react. Nobody can predict how North Korea is going to respond. The times we're living in, you hear this time and time again. For every 13 years of war in history, the world has known only one year of peace. 13 years of war, one year of peace. In fr since 1945, the number of wars have increased. After the World War II, the number of wars 
happening in this world have dramatically increased. And they say, the scholars say, the world has not known a single day of peace after World War II. Strange. There are 300 wars that are being fought since World War II. There's some nation raging a war, waging a war against some other nation. There's war and conflict. Well, it doesn't seem like it in Upper Ten Talon, does it? But the rest of the world, somebody right now is running somewhere from ISIS. Syria is a mess, civil war. And imagine families grabbing what they could and they're hiding somewhere. People are starving somewhere. That's the reality on this same planet that you and I are sitting on. Dramatic times. 200 million people have died just in the 19th century alone. 200 million people. It's the greatest year of bloodshed ever known. Greatest century of bloodshed ever known to human history. The far more sobering thing in all this is in order to promote an increase because of the pressure for the increase of wars and the tension of wars, the advancement of scientific technology and discoveries is increasing. Military budgets are increasing. Devastating weapons are mass produced. Weapons of mass destruction are coming and you probably heard that a lot of times in the past. The first time in human history, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a phase where we can completely destroy ourselves on this planet, we are capable to do it. And believe it or not, if you read the scriptures in Ezekiel 37 and 38, you will see a nuclear war that is very well described. The Bible says the eyes will melt in the sockets and the flesh will melt before the bones hit the ground. Strange. Times are coming. Nuclear, chemical, biological weapons are being produced. And all this is leading up to the final battle. Everything is coming together for these end times. The final sign I want to show you this morning is the increase in knowledge. Daniel 12, 4 says this. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words, seal them up uh, in the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Many will go back and forth, knowledge will increase. Nobody can deny the fact that there has been a tremendous explosion of knowledge that we can't even keep up with in this past century. Do you agree? Knowledge has increased so much that I'll give you one illustration. For 6,000 years, man only knew how to travel by a camel or a horse and a buggy, till the time of John Wesley, till the 17th century. But now people travel between countries as if they go from one village to other. Right? I mean, imagine those times during the gold rush where they packed up all the cart and they started in the east and by the time they reached California, the next generation came up. You know, the, I feel like that with my four sons. If I have to go somewhere, I need a cart. Right? And I said, we'll reach you in 20 years' time, right? That's the kind of times you're living in. But look at the advancement, the supersonic travel, where you can go from one country to another. If you want your pet to have hair trimmed, you can go from Europe to New York and have it trimmed and go back home again. You're missing a soda, a particular flavor, you can go to Italy and pick that up and come back home again. What kind of days are we living in? People's transportation methods have changed. The technology has changed. The people's skill has changed. Now we can even travel to the moon. In the early 19th century, if a dad told a young kid, son, I'm going to the moon, the kid would have probably said, dad, stop kidding me, daddy. But if you tell your son today, son, I'm planning to go to the moon, he said, can you bring me a Kit Kat on your way back? Times have changed, ladies and gentlemen. Technology is revolutionized everything. We are living in times where people are going back and forth. Computers, scientific, medical discoveries are increasing. The DNA and cellular technology. I was in the field of genetic engineering. Biotechnology. The amount of stuff you can do, gene manipulation, you can have designer babies made. Oh, I want my baby to have a curly hair with a sharp nose and a nice tan like Kamal. You can do that. You can do that genetically. 
There's so much advance in the medical field that is absolutely astonishing. But there's also a dual application for the knowledge to increase. I want you to focus on this one. Not only the knowledge to live in this world increases, but the knowledge of God is also going to increase in these last days. The amount of resources that are available, ladies and gentlemen, are exorbitant and are beyond number as to how you can understand and know any concept about God in these last days. Thanks to Google. You're thinking, you know, how I prepare for my sermons? Google. I don't know what I do without Google. Right? So, you know, it's just so much technology, so much information, so much so many resources available. An average American or a North American has three Bibles in his home. Concordances, dictionaries, lexicons, your commentaries, your multiple things to know about God. And yet we are the most la the laziest, laziest of the generations who doesn't even read the Bible, doesn't even touch the Word of God. What a tragedy. That's what I never got this concept where God says in the last days there will be famine of the word of God. How can there be famine? Because you have Bible on MP3, Bible on CD player. You can get your Bible in pink. You can buy, get your Bible in whatever format you want. NKJV, NIV, KJV, ESV. The message, whatever you want, you can get. And what kind of times are we living in? And how can we say we're going to have a starvation of understanding the word of God? I want you to think about, has your knowledge of God increased in these last days? But that will be one of the signs that God said he gave. See, for thousands of years, Christians lived in the dark. Thousands of years. They called the dark ages. Bible was not translated then. So the church had the authority. The corrupt church manipulated people, saying whatever they could. So if you translate to a common man's language, you're in big trouble. Thankfully, reformation happened. People paid the price with their life like William Tyndale in order to get the Bible translated into a common man's language. Until that, it only exists in Latin and uh, Greek and some other languages. People had no idea, but look at us today. We are so blessed to have so many translations. But also this one sign that is attached to it. The Bible says, The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for all the, uh, for, uh, for the, uh, preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then the end shall come. A century ago, a century ago, people would not have thought that they could communicate and pass on the gospel so quickly to the other parts of the world. But the means of technology, satellite imagery, and uh, all the means of communication, internet, satellite phones, Missionaries are able to make inroads, and the gospel is going to the remotest of places. So as you can see, we are living in a time like none other. We're living in times which prove, these are only five points I gave you, there's a whole whack of them, close to 50 or so, I just picked five this morning. The times are coming to an end. There are enormous Problems facing mankind like disease, famine, disasters, terrorist threats. There's a great moral vacuum that is existing in this modern civilization. Trillions and trillions of dollars have been spent in advancing technology, not for the betterment of human life, but it's only getting worse. Technology that is supposed to help here is only causing depression in people's lives iPhone 5, iPhone 6, iPhone 6S, it's supposed to make your life easy. It's not. People are suffering from depression, and a new form of depression is the fact that they can't keep up with the technology, it seems. So what kind of times are we living in? We know that we are clearly living in these last days. But here is the goodness of our God. There's one thing I want to wrap up this whole thing with. God never pours out His judgment without warning His people. God never pours out his judgment without warning his people. He's a just and a loving God. He loves everyone unconditionally. His son paid the price upon the cross for every person on this planet. If only they believe and repent of their sins and receive him as a Lord and Savior. So the fact of the matter is we are at the threshold of his return. We are living on borrowed time, ladies and gentlemen. We are living on borrowed time. And my question to us is, do you know Jesus Christ 
as your Lord and Savior. The word Jesus in Greek, Yeshua in Hebrew means salvation. If you know Jesus Christ, you will be saved. In Him there is life. Outside Him there is hopelessness and there is death. You might say, hey, there are multiple religions in this world. What makes Christianity the only one? People, people tell me in India all the time, we have 330 million gods and goddesses and counting. They say that all the time, say, hey, all roads lead to God. All gods lead to the same thing. The problem is all religions cannot lead you to God because all religions claim that they're all true. If all are true, then who is the liar? For one to be true, the other one must be a lie. And they all came to be the, we are the only way. So the other religion claims, we are, we, us is the only way. So how can they both be right? They can't. Thankfully, the Bible declares and says in Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say I'm one of the ways, one of the truths, and one of the ways to get life. He's the article, the way, the truth, and the life. And in order to attest that statement, the testimony of, the, of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. He gave you these signs for us to notice, we went through a few, to know that he is God and there is none other. You either choose to believe him or you don't. Inside the ark, there was life. Outside the ark, there was death and destruction. Inside the ark, that is Christ himself, we are safe. Outside Christ, there is no hope. Salvation is at stake. So if you have been lingering for a while in your commitment towards God. It's important to make that call because you're at the verge of history, history concluding. It's important for you to make the call, choose this day whom you want to serve. You want to serve God, the real God, the God of your salvation, the God who paid the price for your sins. And all he asks, us, he asks you to do is repent and believe in him and you will be saved. Or you can choose to go with the ride with the end that is coming. I've shown you the signs. I don't want to go through it. I want to be safe in Christ. That's where my security is. But if you are a Christian, if you are saved, I want to tell you one thing. Do not be afraid. <laughs> Do not be afraid. All these things that are going on, they will get worse, ladies and gentlemen. But do not be afraid because God is your keeper. The Lord is the shade at your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. He will preserve you from all evil. He is your rock. He is your refuge. He is your stronghold. He is your fortress. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. We as believers in Christ, there's nothing to panic. When the last plague in Egypt fell, the plague of darkness, the plague of the death of the firstborn, you know what the Bible says? There was darkness in the land of Egypt, but there was light in Goshen, light where the Israelites were. Our God will keep us safe. Our God will feed us. Our God will take care of us. We need to believe that he can. There's no need to be afraid. But all we have to do is cry out, as the Bible, the book of Revelation concludes and says, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. I am excited for Christ to come back soon. Are you? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, what a wonderful time we're living. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. May that be a cry. Long for his re return. You know, this week, my heart was wrenched when I saw the news. They were taking a brain of an aborted baby while the baby was still alive. This is something, I, I didn't have the guts to watch the video. But when I saw that, it's like, Lord, the depravity. How far have we gone? How far have we gone, O Lord? We have sinned against you and you alone. I said, come, Lord Jesus. I can't handle this world anymore. I can't handle what I'm, what I'm watching anymore. There's no way I can handle this situation. I have you come to that place where we need a savior, we need a deliverer, we need to, for him to come back soon. 
He is waiting and he is eager. But his only intention is that none should perish. If you have been pushing off God for a while, he, God doesn't want you to push off anymore. If you hear his voice and your heart is being compelled this morning, I want you to take this one step of faith. You want to say, I want to see first and then I'll believe. God has shown you enough. God says, believe me and you will see. Believe and you will see. You want to see his goodness? Believe and you'll see. Time for you to stand up for the right reason. Cross that line. Stop lingering around. Stop sitting on the fence. Give your life to Jesus Christ who gave his all for you. Be a real child of God. Don't, if you're a Christian who's pretending in your walk, it's time to stop acting and it's time, time to get real with God. If not, God is going to take you through things so that he'll get your attention. So chimes we are entering will be tough, ladies and gentlemen. That's why I wanted to, I was compelled to do this series and there is a reason why. So be prepared. We don't know what God is going to do. By the end of this series, everything might disappear. We don't know. But we know that God is preparing us for these times ahead. So be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, not your own. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your sincere love towards us. Time and time again, you went the extra measure to tell us what would happen during these times? You get, took these extra measures to warn us and said, prepare yourself for my coming is near. Lord, we are excited for you to come back, but we want to be prepared for your return. Lord, if our hearts have grown cold, if our love has compromised, we humbly pray you turn us from a lifestyle of adultery and compromise. Turn our hearts towards you. Forgive us for our wickedness. Forgive us for our relentless pursuit of this world. Help us not to be seekers of pleasure. Help us not to be seekers of wealth, fame, popularity, or plaudits. But help us to seek you from the depths of our hearts, depths of our longing, from the deep recesses of our heart. May we long for a living God. And may we say, come Lord Jesus soon. Meanwhile, we pray for the innocents, the widows, the orphans, the children. Oh Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on this depraved society. Have mercy on this depraved culture. Have mercy on these people who are shaking their hands, their fists in your face. Have mercy on those people who call good evil and evil good. Lord, send revival and heal this land. It's time for you to show up in all your glory. Lord, you said to Israel, for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet. For Zion's sake, you will not relent. Oh, that you would rise from your throne and set the twigs ablaze and cause the water to boil. Oh, Lord, ride on the white horse. Come in all your power and all your victory and take over seaside. Give us a hearts that are consumed by love and passion for you, not just emotionally speaking but through your word in truth help us to forsake the lifestyles that we have been living this long father we pray you have your favor upon this body and this congregation you have your eye upon us O gentle gracious shepherd would you lead us into your promises would you lead us from strength to strength from glory to glory I pray, Lord, that may the focus of our lives be Christ and Christ alone. I pray for the marriages in this church. Pray for the children. Pray for disobedient children. Pray for wayward children. Pray for the widows. Pray for the orphans. Pray for those who are struggling financially. Pray for those who are struggling in health time and time again. Oh God, show yourself strong. Come redeem marriages. Come redeem households. Come redeem people from their situations. And God, you are God. And there is none other. Great is your faithfulness. In Jesus' matchless name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully this teaching has blessed you today. Trust you will join us weekly in pursuing God through His Word. You can join us at seasidecommunity.org, Facebook, or via YouTube. We always enjoy our listeners' feedback, so send your comments and prayer requests 
through info at seasidecommunity.org, for we would love to hear from you. And now, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, 